Yeah. Okay. Shall we start? Yeah. Uh, David, you're on. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone, um, and especially our amazing Dr. Bern Volschlager. Um, we're very honoured that you have the time to be here with us to introduce you to our Edgeware Synagogue members and a lot of others. Um, it's a great pleasure that you can spend some time with us today. Especially, um, it's in the middle of the afternoon for you, and I'm sure it's a bit warmer there, um, as I know you're an extremely busy physician in Miami. Um, your story um, is very important to us as, as, as Jews. Um, now, this is to everybody else. Um, Dr. Rorschlag will be talking, um, and he'll be talking right the way through to the end of his, his meeting. Um, and then we'll do the questions and answers when he finishes um, his talk. Um, you can put your hands up, um, put it in the chat um, button or in the bottom of the Zoom. Um, and there's a facility um, in the participants section to, um, we'll, we'll find you. So Dr. Wolfschlanger will discuss his astonishing book, A German Life Against All Odds, Change is Possible. The book tells a remarkable story of his German life, growing up in Germany in the shadow of his father, a highly decorated World War II tank commander and Nazi officer. Eventually, um, uh, he converted to um, Orthodox Judaism, emigrating to Israel and serving at the IDF as a medical officer. Um, please welcome Dr. Bernd Volschlager. Thank you very much. Thanks, David, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, every time when I'm speaking to a crowd that I don't see, or at least most of them, I ask myself, why on earth am I doing what I'm doing? Because I, my life or anybody's personal life is personal. And uh, normally people just don't share that in the way I share it. And in the same way I looked at my life uh, too. I didn't talk about it for many, many years. Until my son Tal, he's uh, now 31 years old, he was about 15 at that time, asked me a very simple question. He asked me, Dad, who is my grandfather? You would think that's a normal, no problem answer to be given in a, in a second, but there was a little problem. On the one hand, his father, yours truly, uh, is a Jew, an Israeli citizen, and served in a combat unit as a combat physician in the Israeli army. And on the other hand, his grandfather, my father, was a highly decorated World War II German tank commander and a convinced National Socialist. So how can you approximate these two worlds? And that's what I told my son many, many years ago. I'm trying to tell you with a different spin because a lot of information has been revealed afterwards after I came out, so to say, with my story. So how did it all begin? Well, first of all, life begins uh, at the time and the place that you're born in and born at. And I was born in May the 9th, 1958, in a gorgeous city in Germany called Bamberg. I used the German pronunciation, uh, B-A-B-M-E-R-G. It's one of those pearls of, of German history nestled between Würzburg, nestled between Würzburg and Nuremberg in an area that's called Franconia, untouched by any wars and literally a time machine even today when you walk through the city you feel yourself going back in time and admiring history as it unfolds and that was my upbringing in this beautiful town we learned as children to appreciate history who was living in what house uh, why the only pope buried outside rome is buried in bamberg the cathedrals the churches so we literally sucked it up with our mother's milk if i may say so but one thing was funny. I mean, imagine I was a six, seven, eight-year-old boy. There was something about history that our teachers and our parents obviously didn't talk about, even though it was obvious that something happened. And we knew, I mean, I knew that there was a war, what kind of war I didn't know. I found out that this war, we obviously didn't win because there was American soldiers, there were American soldiers stationed in the city. A city of 75,000 was the host, so to say, to 15,000 Americans and soldiers and family members. We had constantly NATO maneuver, low lying, low flying planes, jet pla planes and uh, fighter jets. So we as children grew up with that. So something happened. We didn't win that war that my parents and nobody wanted to talk about. When I asked about my father, my father and parents and my grandparents maternally and, and paternally, 
the answer that I got is they're gone with the war. So the war had a massive impact on our time, massive impact on their lives, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Slowly but surely, my parents realized that they had to tell me something about that war uh, because I would learn it anyway. And my father finally decided to tell me his side of the story and my mother her side of the story, not in the same day. It just was a flowing of the next few months and even years after I first heard about it. I was about seven, eight years old. And what my father told me about the time was the following. He was the youngest tank commander in the German army, serving under the command of General Guderian, the father of the German Blitzkrieg. And my father belonged to this elite unit as the youngest uh, officer storming forward in every battlefront that Germany opened. September 1939, the attack on, this, on Poland. The following year, the, in, in August, in, in summer 1940, the attack on France, ben Benelux, I mean Belgium, Luxembourg. My father's tanks were the first to roll in. And then, of course, the fo year, following year in 1941, the attack on the former Soviet Union, uh, Operation Barbarossa, where my father served literally as the tip of the spear and conquered a strategically located town on the push towards Moscow called Orel. And for that surprise attack and conquest of the town of Orel, my father was awarded the Knight's Cross by a man whom he still adoringly referred to as his Führer, Adolf Hitler. Now, you cringe, but I never heard about Adolf Hitler at that time. I didn't know anything about the Third Reich and the Second World War. What I knew that my father was obviously a hero. And this message that my father was a hero was reinforced by his old war buddies who came to celebrate the good old times in our house at least once a year. And they sat together and I sat with them because there was no other distraction and I wanted to learn from these men of honor and fighters and officers. I wanted to learn what they, these stories that they told my father and of course me. And they referred to my father as Arturo, Arthur was his first name, our hero. And you, that means me, as his son, I should mighty proud of him. So whatever my, my father did or not did, I was proud about my father because everybody else was proud of him too. On the other hand, my mother told me a completely different story. Not the story of glory, not the story of the knight in shining armor, but the story of horror. She was an ethnic German, uh, so-called Sudeten German, born and raised in the former territories of the Sudetenland, which is now Czechoslovakia or Slovakia. And she belonged to a privileged class of people because my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was very wealthy. And they could afford to live in a beautiful villa in the outskirts of Karlsbad. And uh, as the Soviet troops approached, my father urged my mother uh, to flee. And she fled with my gra maternal grandparents. They died uh, fatally wounded during the time uh, of the uh, flight from uh, Sudetenland and were eventually died from the f consequences of this, of this very stressful time and fleeing towards the West. So I have on the one hand, my father, the stories of glory. On the other hand, my mother, the story of horror. But nobody told me anything more about it. And there was something funny even in our house that was literally was soaked with history. We lived in a house in downtown Bamberg. The house is still standing. It's a patrician style, massive building. The entire upper floor looked like a basketball field in the size. And we rented an apartment downstairs from the landlord or the landlady. My mother referred to her as the Countess, the Gräfin, and I should never speak to her unless spoken to. And right next to the wooden stairway leading upstairs to the Countess's apartment was in the hallway a larger-than-life portrait of a man mounted on the wall in officer's uniform and officer's insignia of the on the shoulders and the officer's cap, but with a different facial feature. And when I asked my father who this man was, my father referred to him as the traitor, the Verräter. Now, I was a little bit puzzled. How can it be? That on the one hand, my father, who looks like him in uniform, and at least I saw pictures of my father in uniform, how can it be that my father in uniform is a good person? And on the other hand, this man who looked like my father is a bad person. I didn't understand. And nobody explained me why. Until I learned from the lady upstairs that this was a portrait of a late husband, Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, the German colonel who was leading the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944, which unfortunately failed. And he was executed the same night. His wife, Nina von Stauffenberg, was imprisoned two days later by DSS. 
and thrown in a concentration camp in Ravensbrück and survived with the help of German officers. And on the other end, her children were giving up for adoption, were on the way to Buchenwald for final treatment, and uh, they uh, survived too, and they were reunited and rejoined the family and lived in this house in the second floor. So I couldn't, shouldn't talk to her. My father was angry about her. So what is the deal? Not that I've verbalized it in the same fashion as I'm verbalizes it now. Um, until I found out. My, my parents on Sundays, they uh, were after, the, after lunch, they were tired. They took a Mittagsschlaf, so it's called in German, a little nap over the, in the afternoon after, dinner, after lunch. And I used the time to sneak upstairs to the Countess's apartment because she had grandchildren. When I mean, they were grandchildren, was this big boto of Abu, and I sneaked upstairs and played with them. And I still remember my impressions of this apartment, this huge apartment, wall to wall covered with pictures about her, Nina von Stauffenberg, and her husband, Klaus von Stauffenberg. Obviously, a loving family, a caring husband. Why is my father so mad about him? Why is my father so angry? Why is this man called a traitor? I mean, I was about 14 years old. We started to talk about the, about 12, 11, 12 years old. We, we started to talk about this part of German history that nobody wanted to talk about. And the way we learned about it was a little bit mm, peculiar, at least. So what our teachers started to tell us is that uh, Germany succumbed to a dictatorship in January the 1933, when Adolf Hitler took over the government. And within several months, uh, those who were not agreeing with his government and those who were belonging to the communist and the socialist parties were uh, swept up from the streets and thrown into concentration camps, work camps, we, told, we were told they are. And um, Hitler started the Second World War. 60 million people died or 70 million people died. Among them, 6 million Jews as collateral damage of war. That's all what I learned. And then on the 8th of May, 1945, Germany capitulated. And like the Huns invading Germany, huff and puff, they disappeared and everything was fine and we returned to normalcy. Well, that was a bunch of horse manure. It's a PG rated event. I don't want to use the right word because something else happened there that nobody wanted to talk about. And then came the event that changed my life and changed my generation's life. I can say so without exaggeration. The Olympics in Germany in 1972, München 1972 in August. And we were prepped towards admiring this event and, and, and being proud about this event hosted to be in Germany because in 1936, when the last time the Olympics took place in Germany, Hitler abused it for propaganda purposes. And now we have a new Germany, a Germany, that democratic Germany, that wanted to demonstrate to the world that we returned and we are different people. And my parents, I remember, bought the first TV, black and white, th though, and uh, everybody in, in order to, to watch this Olympics. And also very important for this time was that Germany had now, in, had since 1969, a new government that was a total break of the past. And that was one, one of the reasons that Germany was awarded the, the honor to host the Olympics in Munich in 1972. Because in 1969, a man rose to power. His name was Willy Brandt, our chancellor, then chancellor, who was never tainted by the past like his predecessors who were former Nazis. Kiesinger, the former uh, prime minister of Germany from 1966 to 1969, was a member of the National Socialist Party. On top of it, he was a propaganda minister. He was working in the propaganda ministry of the NSDAP, the National Socialist Party. So he, Willy Brandt was a victim of the Nazis. He had to flee Germany returned to Germany um, in 1949 to rebuild the Social Democratic Party. And in 1969, he was voted into an office with the, in a great landslide. And his, one of his first acts was to travel to Poland and in December 1970, and in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial, he sank on his knees, bowed his head, and remained in silent prayer for many minutes. And this picture of the chancellor kneeling in front of the Holocaust or the the memorial in Warsaw, of the ghetto memorial, it went around the world and was on every newspaper front page. And my father, I remember, slammed the newspaper on the breakfast table that we normally read together, and he educated me about uh, current and future events, yelling and screaming in German, schau mal her, wieder ein Verräter, look burned, again a traitor. And I was puzzled. 
because first of all, I was raised in the Orthodox Catholic faith that my mother uh, adopted. My father was a Protestant though, um, so he was and he called himself an atheist. So I learned religion from my mother. I went to the Catholic kindergarten, Catholic school, uh, church. I was an altar boy. She wanted me to become a priest. Obviously, that didn't work out. And I, uh, based on that, I considered a prime minister or chancellor kneeling in front of a memorial is something very positive. It's something that I would have done too. Why is my father so mad? And the same chancellor with his moral standing in the Western world, this tremendous uh, image in the Western world as the, new, as the face of the new Germany, opened the Olympics in August 1972 to a great fanfare. And with our new television at home, black and white though, my parents invited friends over. It was a festive atmosphere, wine, food, beer. And all the teams paraded into the stadium carrying their respective flags. And one team paraded into the stadium carrying a flag with a star inside. I had no idea what this team was, but I noticed that the adults reacted differently to that. Suddenly nobody talked. It was kind of the do not ask the question moment. And I asked myself, that's weird. This is just another team. It could be Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, United States. It's another team competing. And then 10 days later, the unthinkable and the ho most horrible thing that I ever heard about happened in Germany. The same team that so proudly paraded into the stadium was brutally attacked by a group of Palestinian terrorists who climbed the fence in the Olympic village in Munich, attacked the Israelis in their apartments, murdered, actually butchered two of the Israelis on the spot. One escaped and the remainder were taken hostage. And the next day, the German government dispatched the highest ranking member of the German government, the Minister of Interior, the Minister of For Foreign Affairs, negotiating personally with the leader of the terrorists called Isa. And they begged Isa to take them, members of the German cabinet, politicians as hostages in lieu of the Israelis and to release the Israelis from the, from the terrible fate that they are succumbed to. Unfortunately, uh, Isa didn't allow that to happen. They demanded immediately to be flown out at the same night uh, to a military airport right next to uh, Munich called Fürstenfeldbruck. And from there, they wanted to be taken, flown by a German Boeing 707, the German Air Force Boeing 707, to a uh, city, most likely uh, Tripoli or Cairo, uh, to celebrate the successful attack on the Israeli athletes and demanding from the Israelis to release hundreds of prisoners of war uh, and terrorists uh, to in lieu of the Israelis uh, athletes. And I remember what happened beat by beat. I can play it like a movie in my head. Um, the helicopters took off in the night. It landed behind the closed gates of the military airport, first in Fairbrook, which was hermetically sealed off. Nobody could get in. And suddenly all hell broke loose. Firefight, light, night was lit with explosions. Firefight lasted at least two hours. And then deafening silence. I remember the moment when an American journalist turned towards the camera exhausted and stayed, made a simple statement. They're all gone. What happened, the Germans tried to liberate the hostages, um, which was a, an attempt to liberate skilled terrorists, elite fighters with BB guns. Um, the Israeli Mossad unit on the ground, specifically Mossad unit Kidon, um, the leader of the Mossad unit, it, I think it was Tzvi Aroni, begged the German government not to attack because they're dealing here with skilled terrorist fighters. The German government did anyway, uh, actually demanded from the Israelis to, to get off the premises uh, that this is a German affair. And subsequently during this firefight, Issa threw a hand grenade in one helicopter which exploded and all Israelis perished in a fireball. And the next helicopter was sprayed with machine gun fire and everybody died. And the next day in the newspaper, this picture that changed my life, like the picture before, but this was a definite change of, of my direction of my life. Two helicopters on the tarm tarmac with the burnt uh, remains of the Israelis inside still. The other helicopter with the bodies of the Israelis slumped over the seats, barely covered with linen, bloodstained linen. And a big headline in the newspaper, Jews killed in Germany again. Now I speak perfect German, I think so. And, um, I asked myself, what do you mean again? So when I came home 
from the school where we talked about this time and the importance to understand what happened. I asked my father in school, we learned that there something happened, something Holocaust, something that, that we as Germans should be, feel responsible for. My father looked at me, this is all a lie. Holo they all a lie, Holocaust never happened. Your teachers are communists. So I was caught between a rock and a hard place, a curious child trying to find out what happened. And on one hand, my teachers told us the story that my father refused to tell. And our teachers told us the story without in the absence of a Holocaust curriculum, the way they perceived it. Some died. And for the first time I heard Auschwitz, Final Solution, Eichmann and Mengele, these names I never heard before. And then the reaction of my father at home that pushed it away and stated, this is not real, that your teachers are communists, instilled in me the curiosity, I need to find out. And I let, read every book that I could find, any magazine, anything had to do with that time. And as more as I read and the more I was made aware about what truly happened, I had this sinking feeling that my father was concealing something from me, from us, from his family. And I tried to find out. Now, my father, of course, wouldn't talk and wouldn't engage in any conversation about it, but I knew that my father was an alcoholic. As a child of an alcoholic parent, um, I knew that there are three phases during the day. Phase one is looking for a drink, is restless, irritable, discontent. On the other side, on the third phase, he's drunk and you cannot talk to him. But in a, in a twilight zone, I call it nowadays the shicker zone, uh, it's, I make it up, he was um, amendable to give me money, to talk to me. And in this zone, I struck. And I asked him questions over the course of the few years that I was able to ask these questions. And the first series of questions can be wrapped up in phase one. Uh, when my father responded to my question and said, look, we were the military. We were the Wehrmacht. We fought with honor. Whatever allegedly happened in the East, it was not us, it was the SS. Now that was a blatant lie. Later I verified that 20 years after my father's death, that he sat together with an, as a picture with Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, in a meeting in 1942 in, 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 the, in Russia. And when the head of the SS met with ranking German officers, it was about securing territory for mass murder. So the Wehrmacht stood by, securing the territory. So that was a lie. I also knew that my father was lying because I learned from the lady upstairs with whom I had quite a few very interesting conversation, Nina von Stauffenberg, that her husband noticed the difficulties of train su of su troop supply in the Eastern Front. And because all the trains that were, or some of the trains that were necessary to supply the troops with weapons, warm clothing, shoes, were diverted with human cargo to a place called Auschwitz-Birkenau. And so he knew, ranking officers knew, my father knew. And then came phase two when, I, when he responded to my questions. Well, when we killed people or when people were accidentally killed, they were not soldiers, they were, uh, they were combatants. And according to the Geneva Convention, combatants you can kill. It's kind of a rule that I just fulfill. And I asked him just a rhetoric question. I said, are you out of your mind? There were 1.2 million children at least that were murdered, they were gassed, their bodies burned, their ashes scattered in the, in the pits of Auschwitz, the Dante's Inferno of Auschwitz. This is not right, something you don't tell me. They don't find and they didn't fight against the mightiest army in the world. And then phase three was one evening he was blasted. He was drunk. And he looked at me and said, you are weak. You belong to the weak generation. I wanted to educate you as a strong German, but you're weak. I said, what do you mean by weak? Well. We took care of all the Dreck. We took care of all the Jews. We took care of all these unworthy lives. We should get a medal, an honor. It's an honor what we did to free the world from the schmutz. And that was the last straw that broke the camel's back. I didn't look up to my father as the hero, as this naive little boy that admired his father. I looked at my father as with disdain, disdain, despair, disgust, everything. And I turned away from him. And I wanted to find out what truly happened. And one of my teachers, a former Jesuit priest, told me, Bernd, if you want to find out about what happened, you have to make amends to those who were harmed. And as a Catholic, I understood that. And I asked him, so how can I make amends to those who were harmed? I mean, you mean the Jews? If I don't know a Jew. The only thing I knew about Jews was in Sunday school, the Jews killed Jesus and they were bad people. 
And he said, look, there's a group of Israelis that the progressive wing of the Catholic Church, among the many Jesuits, invite to Germany once a year to learn from each other and to meet German uh, with German youth in order to have a learning experience about the past and build a better future. And I joined this group. He allowed me to join this group as the only German participant. And when young people get together in a seminar center in, in a beautiful river Rhine Valley, when you want young people get together the last thing that you talk about is what separates you what divides you the first thing you do you're trying to find common ground what music do you like what 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 is your what food do you like and i like these really girls heck of a lot so i, I didn't have only spiritual needs uh so you can take my halo off but uh, i felt in love with one of these really girls and these really girls at least the ones that i knew um very pushy and very straightforward and she said, well, if you tacheles, if you want to be my friend, you have to come to Israel and I introduce you to my parents. But I was a big Schwitzer. I said, sure, I do that. There was just a teeny little problem. I neither had a passport nor had money. And she left and my heart was broken. So I, I started some summer jobs, get some money together, get a passport uh, and uh, travel to Israel in a very adventurous way. I do not recommend that to, re to repeat. I hitchhiked to Munich, and from Munich I took a train across the Alps to Ancona, is a port city in Italy at the Adriatic Sea. And from there I shipped out on the uh, on the, the Friday with, on the deck, actually a ferry it was, and slept on deck. It was not a cruise. In Piraeus we reprovisioned, and I sent a telex from Piraeus to her home that I would arrive in that in that time and that in that day. And that was before Google Schmuggle and all that. We had really make an effort to communicate. And when we arrived in Haifa, I remember the boat was slowly uh, arriving in the harbor. The mountains of the, the Carmel Mountains literally rose from the bottom of the sea. So it looked like it, at least for me. There were a group of Israelis on board on deck and praying with the Talis and uh, the Talit and the Tfilin. It was a very magical environment atmosphere. And when the boat docked and I stepped for the first time on Israeli ground, I had mixed feelings. That is a, an understatement. Because I didn't know my name is Volschläger. Maybe somebody recognized my name. Maybe if my father did some horrible things. I cannot, I, I hope nothing will happen. But all these doubts were wiped away when uh, she, I saw her on the other side of the, uh, of the uh, gate. And she embraced me and said, let's go to my parents. We took a shirut, a public taxi, went up the Carmel Mountain in Nefesh Anan, which was a working class neighbor, neighborhood at that time. And uh, her parents were waiting outside as if I was the long lost son. They take my father, took my rucksack, her mother took a bag that I carried, chit chatting with me in Yiddish. I had no idea what they were talking about. And uh, moving actually moved all the belongings in the small apartment to one room to make one room available for me. I was the guest of honor. And during dinner time, they've dished out whatever they could afford hummus, trina, falafel, Israeli salad, and chit chatting or trying to chit chat with me, but I didn't understand. And then her father turned to me and looked at me and spoke in halting but clear German. If you want to speak German, Bernd, I still speak German. And ask him, how did you learn that? And he didn't say a word. He looked in my eyes, lifted up his shirt, and showed me the number tattooed in his forearm. Ich war in Auschwitz. I was in the camps. I survived. I lost all my family. And I stayed in Germany for the rest of the war, and for, after the war, until 1948, lived in a displaced person camp. And I had to learn that not all Germans were monsters. But I want to know from you, do you understand what happened? Do you know everything? I honestly told him, I don't. And he took me a few days later, took days off from work. He was a foreman, a strong man, uh, working at the unloading and loading of ships in the port of Haifa, very burly, very strong. And he took me to Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim. And he took me by his hand and he walked to the exhibit step by step and i didn't make it to the end i collapsed i could not understand that my people my parents were at least at knowledge of it of that or participated in it how can it be that these people the jews where this family hosted me without any animosity how can it be that they that these people re are able to rebuild their lives rebuild an old nation anew they must be unique i want to learn more about it and when we went back to Germany, I pondered the question how I could find out more about Jews. In Germany, there were hardly any Jews left, 25,000 um, to 27,000, uh, sealed off 
in hermetically protected communities such as in Frankfurt, uh, Hamburg, um, Munich, and uh, Berlin. And uh, I approached a small Jewish community in my hometown, which lo and behold was still there. It was a group of um, Holocaust survivors, displaced persons from Poland, who when the displaced person camps were uh, torn down, some of them stayed in Germany. And so did they, this small group formed a small Kehile. And I remember when I was knocking at the glass door uh, in, the back, in, the back, in the back of the building in which it housed the a Jewish community in Bamberg, an old man opened the door and looked at me suspiciously and told me, asked me in Yiddish, was willst du? And I must have been rambling something that he felt comfortable to open the door and followed me and said, follow me. And I walked to the corridor and I remember like yesterday, the corridor was dark, black. And there was just one light in the corner of the corridor, which was the Nertamit, which I later learned. And the walls were covered wall by wall by, with black granite plates. And all, each granite, granite plate, there were names engraved. And ask him, what does that mean? He said, you don't know? These are all the Jews from Bamberg that, dis that disappeared in Theresienstadt, 1500, nobody came back. Very few came back. And he took me to his office. It was a hot day. Um, there was the, no air conditioner at that time. There was even the fan was not working. The windows closed, the curtain drawn. It was warm. And he had this, you know, the very, it was a small man, approximately to my shoulder, that was his size. Um, took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeve, and his pale skin, I noticed the number tattooed. And he noticed immediately that I looked at it. So das ist Auschwitz. Ich war in Auschwitz. My name is Itzhak Rosenberg. What do you want? Tough as nails. And I told him my story and said, that's a sad story. What do you want to do? I said, I want to help. You want to help. But can you teach me maybe before I can help or help and teach me? I said, look, young man, you're a peculiar man. I know I'm not a teacher. I'm 14, at the age of 14, I survived Auschwitz. I had to rebuild some form of life. So I'm definitely not the best teacher, but I need somebody to help us here in the Kihila, in the Kihila. And maybe I can teach you something on top of it, but uh, you need to agree to the deal. There's nothing free in life. You will be our Shabbos Goy, my Shabbos Goy, and in return I will teach you. Uh, I had no idea what Shabbos Goy, Shabbos Shmoy meant. I had zero idea, but it sounded good. And I said, so what do we need to do? Come Friday, this Friday, and uh, I will tell you, what time? Seven o'clock. Well, I was there at seven o'clock. He came at nine, at 8.30. And, I, and he said, what, what do you do here at that time? I said, you told me to come at seven. It was the first lesson you need to learn, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. We don't take it like you with time. So it was my first lesson. The second lesson is that in the Kihila was a small apartment that they converted into a Stiebelech in a, in a beach tube. And uh, there was an Abima, a, a Torah scroll, a kitchen, and I was responsible for setting up the table, the chairs to make food. And when the, the members of the community came in, and Itzhak told me that, you just sit in the corner and don't do anything. Because when they came in, they pointed to me and said, Was macht der Goy dort? Warum der Goy is in the, in the Kihila? And it's like, just waved it away and said, look, they're all Michigan alte cuckers. That's what he said. Don't bother. So every Friday, every Saturday, every week, month by month, year by year, holiday by holiday, I came to this community. And the closer I came to this community of choice, the more absorbed literally the liturgy, the language, the mannerism, the more I separated myself from the community of origin, my family. And it came to a big blow up, many blow ups, but one big one was when my father when Christmas fell on a Friday night. And for my mother, an Orthodox uh, Catholic, it was a big deal. It's like, take the combination of Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and, and uh, pa Passover. That's approximately Christmas in an Orthodox uh, Christian home. We, I remember it like it happened yesterday. We're going to the Mass, the Holy Mass, uh, at 8 o'clock, not at midnight, because we were small children. Uh, my mother had food prepared, lentil soup and carp. It was symbolically uh, symbols. Uh, for Christmas, my father decorated the Christmas tree and we couldn't enter the, the room with the Christmas tree until my father rang the bell and uh, we oh, my mother opened this big uh, oak uh, door and we walking into the, uh, my sister into this uh, room with a beautiful Christmas tree, real candles. My father standing next to it with black, the dark black suit, black tie and a knight's cross around his neck, singing festive Christmas hymns. And I was not present at that event at that time. When I came home, all hell broke loose. And my father demanded to know where I was and said, look, let's stop this Greek tragedy. 
I'm going to a to Jewish temple or to a temple to help to atone, to do something what you destroyed. My father looked at me, what do you mean? I said, you're a murderer. You would still wear this nasty cross around your neck. Use it in the celebration of, of Christ's birth. You a murderer, don't you get it? My father looked at me, raus, get out. There was a little problem, um, kesef, money. I had no money. I did, was in the second to last year in the medical school. I had a scholarship, but I needed some pocket money. I never told anybody in the community, asked them ever about any kind of financial benefits. I just didn't do that. But Itzhak must have told some people. And one of the members of this community, the name was Aaron, for the first time after five years in the community, approached me and said, Du bist der Goy. Very perceptive, Aaron. Yeah, I'm the Goy. Schau mal her, deine Schuhe. Look at your shoes and your jacket in the jacket. Your jacket is dirty, it's schmutzig. Gave me 100 mark, kaufte neue Sachen. So I was insulted. I would, it was not right. And I was given money. I walked over to Itzhak in his office and said, Aaron insulted me, did this and this, and then he gave me 100 mark. Itzhak said, he took, he get you 100 mark? Did you ask him for 200? Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, because you're goy. And I said, what do you mean? I said, that's a joke. Sit down. You have to understand after being five years with us that some, certain things you cannot understand. Many of us, when they came out of concentration camps, had no emotions left. I married a, a non-Jewish woman who, became, who converted to Judaism. She created a beautiful Jewish home for me. Aaron, we only know from the Red Cross that he was in Auschwitz, and that's it. And Aaron took it upon himself to tell me for the first time probably in his life his story, which was too horrible to talk in details about because he was a member of a Sonderkommando in Auschwitz. Sonderkommando were the Jews who were herding fellow Jews in the gas chambers, calming them down. This is the number, took your cloth. For the, each, each cloth, you get a number, a metal clip with a number in there, and then we pick it up on the other side. They closed the door, when the SS then the poured the Cyclone B on top. When the screaming and yelling ended, the Sonder commander went in there with gas mask, pulling out the bodies, pulling out the gold teeth, burning the bodies, crushing the bones, and throwing the remainder next to the pit. Um, that was a 90-day job, guaranteed survival, women, alcohol, food, everything included, until the next group came in, because the first group was gassed, and Aaron survived. Unfortunately, Aaron died six months later. It was probably the reason why he talked to me, because he knew he was dying. And it's a called me from medical school and said, at night, Aaron died. We need a Chefekadisha. We don't have enough able-bodied men. You need to help us. I said, I'm not a Jew. You're one of us. So I became a member of the Chefekadisha. We prepared the body of the night, buried him the next day. And at the open grave, it's a gently put the prayer book in my hand and said, say it. It was a Kaddish. And I said, should I? I, I don't think I can. Say it, you were his friend. And when I said the Kaddish, something happened. I crossed the line. I was in another world. And I knew there was no way back. And I told Itzhak, I want to become a Jew. Itzhak looked at me with sad eyes. I said, you must be crazy. Did you forget already what, what we suffer for? You want to be suffer? You can be a guilt a righteous person. You are. You don't have to do that. You don't have to suffer. I said, I want to do it. So he said, I know a rabbi in, in Heidelberg and in Frankfurt. He will receive you. I, I pay you everything, hotel, train, food, but don't come back and tell me this nonsense about conversion again. Otherwise, you never go back to the rabbi. The rabbi told me the same thing. He wanted to talk me out and we came to an agreement because I was such a nutnik, such a nerd, that I would see him once a month and he would teach me. And every time I talked, our shio ended, I asked him, when can I, when am I ready to convert? And he said, no. Until in April 1986, he relented. And said, look, Bernd, I refer your case to the rabbinical court. I'm just one member of the rabbinical court. They get, get together in December. But until you get there, and there's no guarantee that they will put you uh, on the pedestal and, and convert you, you need to do some steps, irrevocable. One involves a little surgery. Um, I don't want to talk about it. It's not a plastic surgery. And it had to be done in an orthodox ho uh, hospital in Switzerland, in Basel. There was a Mohel in Munich, but he was a drunk and had a shaky hand. So not a good professional reputation. So I was in Basel, uh, haircut it. And uh, two, three months later, un I underwent an immersion in Orthodox Mikveh, in an Orthodox Hasidic community in Metz, France. And on December 1987, end, end of November 1986, I'm sorry, I uh, underwent a halachic conversion in Germany. 
and I remember it as, as it happened yesterday. It was like a, a court session. The rabbi sat on the podium, black robes, black hat. I was sitting on down there, sitting on a chair, and they asked me questions, and they knew everything about me. My character references were piling up, and the chief rabbi asked me one simple question. Why on earth would a German choose to become a Jew without any reason? And I told him my story. He said, are you willing to give it up, everything that you have here? Yes. And what do you want to do when you become a Jew? I want to fight in the army. I want to join the Israeli army because I have nothing to give, no money. I'm a young doctor, but I can give something that was taken from you. And I remember when they read, came back from a Dune, from a session, and they read, I had to stand up, and they read the Teodot Gyu in, in, in German and then in Hebrew. And the rabbi said, do you already know your new name? I said, I didn't think about it. Yeah, your new name is Ben Avraham. That is nothing you can change. But your first name, what is your first name? I said, Bernd. Uh, do you know what it means? No, it's the bear slayer. So we become Dubi. Uh, and I become Dubi Dov Ben Abraham. And within a month, I applied for the, immigra for the immigration. Uh, I got a, according to the Choka Shavut, I was recognized by the Israeli government on the 7th of January with a visa in my passport and a one-way ticket from the Sochnot, the Jewish agency. I flew to Israel, never to go back again. I tried to say goodbye to my parents. They refused to see me. My father was yelling and screaming outside the house that I should get the hell out of here, a traitor. And in Israel, I was assigned to a kibbutz for six months, uh, learned Hebrew, then moved over to a hospital in, in, in Tel Aviv, Ichilov Hospital, and to get my German license up to Israeli par. And then uh, two months later, I was drafted into the Israeli army, a basic training, officer's course, and assigned to a, to a gedut, a base in Ramallah called Beit El. This was the first year of the Intifada of the first intifada the arab uprising and we as soldiers were in full army gear battle gear low nations neshek or weapons all hot and i was a lieutenant standing in front of a group of soldiers in battle gear and our commanding officer said guys this is your new doctor his name is um you have to change the name um dr dove and i was standing there in uniform i asked myself if they know if they find out that i am a my father's son a Nazi in drag, they would kill me. And I decided not to speak about my life. I threw my past in a closet, in a virtual closet, shut the door lock, shut the door, turned the key in the lock and threw the key away, which was a major, major mistake. Until my son Tal asked me the simple question, Dad, who is my grandfather? And I told him the story and said, that's a cool story, let me tell my friends. I said, don't do it. Well, my luck, literally my luck, that three weeks later, they had a family history day at school and everybody talked about their family history in a Jewish school and what's going on and where they're from. And my son raised his hand and declared proudly. And my grandfather was a famous Nazi. Needless to say, I was called to the principal's office and I needed to get my son off the hotline because the principal was very upset. How can it be that a esteemed doctor in our community, your son tell, tells us these crazy stories? And I said, this is the truth. And he asked me, the rabbi who was present in the conversation, asked me to shared this story in his class. And for the first time I shared, the weight was lifted off my shoulders and I decided to go back to Germany with my children, with my child, Tal, for the first time. And I knew the only place I could visit my parents is in the cemetery. And standing at the cemetery in, in Bamberg, right, my parents' grave is right one row parallel to the wall that separates the Christian from the Jewish cemetery. It's not unusual for old cities in Germany. And the gravestones always defiantly on the other side cast their shadow in certain times of the day to the my parents' grave. And I told my son, I said, look, this is the irony of history, that your grandparents rest here in the shadow of history, and they will never step out of it because they never wanted to deal with it. I stepped out of the shadow, looked back, learned my lessons, and moved forward to tell others that we can never, never do what happened in 1933 to 1945, to be not only eternal witnesses, but change agents to change. And I'm thankful for my father, for what he taught me. He probably is not thankful that he taught me, but I am. Because he taught me that words have consequences. 
words of hatred have consequences. If left unchallenged, they fall on the fertile ground, the mind of others, and they sprout into deeds. And these deeds form habit if left unchallenged. And these habits shape social characters if left unchallenged. And these social characters determine and develop social norms. And that explains, but never excuses, that an entire people felt for Adolf Hitler. And everybody said, I didn't know. Everybody knew. Everybody. And so my job, my task, and as long as I can stay on this, on this beautiful earth, is, was, is, and will be to shape the mind of others, to make them aware, think differently, think independently, don't follow the piper, don't follow the leader, be an individual, be critical, because otherwise we're being honeypotted in doing exactly the same thing that happened in the past. And Auschwitz was the eclipse of hatred, and we can never let it happen again. Thank you very much. Hi, um, uh, that was that was some some speech. Um, I know there must be a lot of questions. Um, sure. David Lando, do you want to start the um, the questions off? Okay. Um, Bert, that was extremely moving, and I cannot you, begin to imagine um, how your life. Um, has moved along and transpired over the years and having to live with what you know of your father and it must be extremely difficult. I've, I've often wondered how hatred manifests itself in some people and in terms of your father, do you know whether he disliked a single Jew to start with or whether it was Jews in general? Or was he and many other people just literally following the masses to have absolute hatred for this religion? Well, David, I'm not a historic scholar, but I can tell you um, hatred is not this magic, dark matter in the universe that we don't see and pervades us. And then we are re reacting like Dark Vader. Hatred is something that even normal people develop. Um, specifically normal people that seek answers to situations that they don't understand. And I don't try to pull them off the tube in the chair here that they're sitting in, on the, sitting there. I need to recognize that they're people that are susceptible to hatred. And it can happen in any country, anywhere and anyhow. Hatred against people of other color, hatred of people of another profession, hatred of people with money, without money, whatever it is. And the, but the time that we're living in proves that hatred is marketable again because people want to believe in something simple. They don't want to have complex yes and no, listening to others, trying to shape their opinion, learning from others. They want to have this one sent sentence uh, that, what, that Mexicans are drug dealers, like in our country, that all Germans are Nazis, um, that all Israelis and all Jews are money beggars. They want simple explanations, and that's where hatred begins. And they're no simple explanation. The most important part to combat hatred is communicate with each other one by one and trying to understand what makes us alike and what makes us different. I'm optimistic that that is possible to be done, and, but we need to put effort in it. It takes much less effort to hate than effort to communicate and trying to find common ground. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just one other thing uh, about your father. I don't mean to dwell on this, um, but obviously it's part of your your story, if not your life. My father. I'm sorry. I, I lost a. I missed the second part of your question. I, I just um, say that your father. Obviously, I do don't mean to dwell on on that. Um, but, one aspect of your life is just. I understand your father was arrested in 1945. Yeah, I've got my, a few questions my on that. What what happened to him? And mm -hmm. also then. Given that his position in the Nazi party, how come he was given a full military funeral? Well, David, following, my father was born and raised in a large family in Mark Brandenburg in, Berlin, near, in the, nearby Berlin. Uh, there were uh, landowners. Uh, I think he had eight brothers and one sister. Uh, my grand-grandfather fought in the Franco-Prussian War. My grandfather fought in the First World War. And my father fought in the Second World War. A bunch of warriors, so we call them. He also went to school uh, of the National Socialist Party called NAPOLA, National Political Education Institute. There was the West Point of the Nazis, and he sucked in with his mother's, mother's milk, so to say, hatred and ideology and propaganda. 
He was captured in April 1945 on a uh, desperate push of Tiger, the Tiger Tank Commander, the uh, latest version of German tank tanks fighting against the Americans cross, trying to cross the River Rhine, was uh, captured, uh, was in American and then in British uh, whole, uh, prison. He was, and I have this denazification protocols, I read them, was denazified meaning there was, was had to be ranked if it's a high bad Nazi, a middle rank Nazi, a low rank Nazi. And the Americans and the British went only after the high land. Many, the overall majority of Nazis just disappeared, uh, just disappeared in the populace. So he was never persecuted, but he had, uh, he couldn't work in certain positions anymore, uh, security related. So he was a door to door salesman for 10 years, which was hugely demoralizing for him. Um, then in 1956, he joined the reconstituted West German army, became an officer again, a, a colonel. And uh, after he finished his service, he became a high-ranking minister, high-ranking ministerial aide in the Ministry of Civil Defense in Germany. And he got a pension and a full military funeral. And uh, that's what they did with ex-Nazis. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to, to hold you. I'm sure there are other people. David, I'll hand back to you. Now, I, I, I used to go to Germany quite often on, on, on business um, and, um, my, and I, I was doing business with people of my generation um, and in all the years that I went there and socialised and everything else, um, I never felt any anti-Semitism. I wanted to, but I never heard anything about anti-Semitism um, ever really uh, going to Germany. However, um, that is, I think, and I may be wrong, but um, in my, I believe that, that my generation, which is your generation, the children of the Nazis and, and the Germans, um, have got some sort of guilt because they knew, you knew your father eventually and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but the generation, the next generation, our children, the Germans, do you think there's any... Um, I can't say a problem because I mean what they put into Israel. No, no. Uh, I'm not a, representing Germany. I'm not a German citizen anymore. But I can tell you from my experiences in dealing, growing up in Germany, dealing with Germans, coming back to Germany, talking to Germans, lecturing in Germany, uh, it's a different generation. But one thing they don't want to be hearing all the time, and please allow me to say that, Holocaust here, Holocaust there. Don't. That's the word. Why do we always? That was not me. I never. I. I didn't do it. That were our grandparents. They want to be. They're offering their help in in, in many shapes and form, but they don't want to be reminded that they are they have the eternal stain of being the children of Nazis and the and they want to come to a new level. Well, let's be aware that Germany is probably the fastest growing represents the fastest growing Jewish community in the world. It has fifty thousand Israelis alone live in Germany because German. Germany gave them German citizenship when they could prove any kind of German descendancy, descendants. Uh, of course, not as all warm and fuzzy. There were horrible, a horrible terror attack last year by a deranged, as they call it, lone gunman who couldn't enter the synagogue, uh, and so he shot people outside, two people to death, one in a Turkish bar in a Turkish barbershop or a Turkish cafeteria. There are neo Nazis in Germany, but they are not accepted. This is not from the top to the bottom of the German society. Nazism, anti-Semitism is not accepted. Not here in America. The biggest herd of horrific neo-Nazi propaganda and anti-Semitism is right here in Florida. And uh, that's when you're looking for Nazis, come over. I show you some. <laughs> I, I, was, I was going to ask you a question on that, interestingly. Uh, there's talk, evidently there's been an election in the United States today. Really? I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> uh, um, amongst that, Mr. Trump suggested there'd been major fraud on your nation and he would take election results to the Supreme Court. Um, how do you re um, see the results playing out? But also, do you believe that through his rhetoric, he has incited and thus condoned white supremacy and the KKK. Well, David, a good rabbi, wise rabbi told me, 
don't talk about politics when you present to, to, to a Jewish group because there will be two groups left, 50% who hate you and 50% will love you. <laughs> so therefore don't talk politics. I just talk about the environment of hatred that emerges here in the United States. Our president, who is the president, legally elected president of the United States, engages in, in, in whipping up the, fr and the, the frenzy in, for his own benefit against anybody who is against him. If it's Dr. Fauci, the highest, most highest and sophisticated, highest rank and sophisticated immunologist and infectious disease expert in the world, he whips the crowd into a frenzy, fire him, fire him. He, has, he lives under death threats, Fauci, just to help us to overcome this horrific pandemic. His um, actually condemnation of, of two days ago of doctors like me, uh, he stated that the, the doctors over diagnose COVID-19 in order to make more money, actually to get $2,000 for each, each new case that we over uh, mark. This is total nonsense, but he whips the people into a frenzy. Um, it is a very dangerous time here. And I have taken precautions. I am armed. I have my Israeli passport renewed and fed for my family. I reached out to the Ministry of, of Sarabriot, the Ministry of Health in Israel, to get my now American li Israeli license upgraded because I worked 30 years abroad. I take all measures that in case of cases, I'm gone. I will not stay here when the good people, they, they are called, the marchers, the, those who marched in Charlotte with torches and screaming and yelling, Jews will not replace us. These are good people in his eyes. I don't want to be here when he calls among the good people to defend him. Uh, it's a horrific time. It's a horrible time. And I've continued fighting. I had my share of death threats, um, but I'm not afraid about it because a dog, like you say in he Hebrew, uh, the dog that bar barks doesn't bite. I've got a question from Svetlana Sherlin. Um, I'll read it out to you. Thank you very much for sharing such an incredible story. Not taken for granted. What is your opinion regarding to the actions of the German police during the Olympic 72? I've read an opinion that German police deliberately acted in a non-professional way. No, I disagree with that. I read pretty much every document that I was, it was fascinating and morbid. Pretty much read everything about it. The German police, the Germans after the first day of the attack were overwhelmed to, to, to deal with this issue, like my father said, not again with them. Look what they do us again, because staining Germany's image. The German police wanted to demonstrate that they're capable of liberating hostages. Imagine there were no hostage liberation commando units, any trained units. They wanted to demonstrate that they can do it and didn't listen for advice and didn't listen to the Israeli units on the ground. They were in one shape, one First of all, they were ashamed that it happened in German ground. Secondly, they were determined to demonstrate to the world that he can handle it. Actually, one German uh, police officer was killed. Um, and uh, I think it was a horrific m mistake what happened in, that happens in battle. And it could have gone maybe differently. We don't know, but the German police, whatever you think about them, they tried. Uh, and they just made a very bad decision. Mm. Okay. Can I, can I just change the tone a little bit? Sure. Um, okay. We know we know your life up until you got, you got into Israel, you got into the IDF army, and then you were in medical school. Mm -hmm. What happened afterwards? Well, I what happened afterwards? I, oh, your a, family. And so we know you, you married, yeah, I married uh, my wife in Israel. She's an American Israeli woman. And uh, promised her that we create a comfortable life in Israel as a doctor. What shall go wrong? Uh, well, after six months after discharge from the military, where I started to do a residency training in internal medicine, I was called up again. It was in October, in September 1990, uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and we knew that that would be trouble. And I was called up because I belonged to a special unit uh, that dealing with the chemical warfare, and spent the next two months in the military on a, on a, tough, on a on an emergency call up. Uh, I was outside when the first missiles fell in the, in the a created Tel Aviv area, the Scott missiles in January, January 1991. And we were prepared to deal with chemical weapons and my wife couldn't handle it anymore. Um, 
And I understand that. So she said, look, we go to America, I go up to Miami, you finish your residency training, then maybe we go back. Well, it, oh, we got divorced, I had two more children, I wanted to be close to my children. So I go back and forth to Israel, but I don't live there. And you've got, you have children now? I have three children, 31, 26, and 22. Uh, one lives in, in New York, but my daughter lives in New York. My son is an attorney here in uh, Miami. And of a younger one, she wants to be an astrophysicist and interns with NASA and SpaceX. Okay, I had there, there was um, I read somewhere that that you went back to Germany with your son. Yeah, that's what my and first trip back to Germany. He was born in Israel, wasn't he? Yes, Tal. Yeah, and you took him back. And there's quite a story to that, wasn't there? He actually, my children know my story. Um, they invite me to group me to, to groups that they know uh, are kind of my do my PR and uh, um, they actually my they feel much more appreciated they appreciate me much more because I'm honest and I'm, after years of silence I don't keep silent anymore about anything mm. okay I have a question from the Nardri. Um do you have any cousins and other family in Germany and what is your relationship with them well, I don't have, I have a daughter, a daughter, my sister, my younger sister lives in Germany and I reestablished a communication with her again. She still lives in Bamberg and she's very worried about me be living here, not in Israel, but living here. I had an older sister, 10 years older sister, who unfortunately passed in 2006 and I had the privilege to see her again in 2004 and uh, shepherd her into a better place, uh, got admitted to hospice. And um, unfortunately, she died. I have not, to my knowledge, any cousins. My father concealed for me his his brother and sister were still alive. I met them twice in Berlin, but that's about it. Okay. Have you got time for another couple of questions? Sure. Okay. Um, this is from Jane Myers. How do you feel when you see the rise of anti-Semitism in the UK and Europe? And how can we not have learned what happened in WW2? Because, yes, I watch it and I'm very concerned. Um, I'm concerned about this, that, that it is uh, spreading like wildfire, like a pandemic. Um, and I ask myself, what makes people so attracted to these dark times? Uh, maybe the, because it's monumental, because it's a mass meetings, because it's we are, we are standing together against the enemy, belonging to a group, feeling better about it, that you wear stiefel boots and... Uh, in March, and then there are the others who are against you. They need to be taken care of. People like to be following crowds. I'm the one kind of guy, I'm a really pain in the tourist because I don't follow crowds. I don't do that. I want to be. Ex I want to know why. My question is always why. Anti-Semites have given up the question of why. They did just want to do something. Uh, actually, I was once in Germany uh, in, my, I think I can tell that, um, a security officer from the Israeli embassy um, asked us, a group of Jews and non-Jews, if we're willing to get, provide some information about neo-Nazi groups in Germany in the 80s. Now, obviously, me, it was prior to internet, being not a Jew, uh, uh, doesn't look like a Jew, he was hired, and I went into neo-Nazi meetings. And actually, because my credentials were that my father was a, a elite tank commander and actually adored by many of the alt-Nazis, and uh, I uh, provided information about how many they are, where they're located, what they're doing, uh, until one of them found out that I'm a, I'm a Jew, um, but there were no, con no consequences. Okay, I've just got one other, or a couple of others, actually. Um, another one from Svetlana. Have you encountered, it's quite interesting, okay. have you encountered any problems in Israel because of your family history? No. Really? Actually, I can, I can summarize it in a very simple sentence. In, Jew, in, in August 1990, with the beginning of my Miluim, my reserve duty after th just being discharged from the military three months before, I was stationed on the border between Jordan and Israel and uh, Syria, There's, it's a little bit south of the Kinneret and uh, the Sea of Galil. And uh, it, was a hot, it was a hot zone. Every night it was, it was, Chagiga. It was something going on at the border. And um, you, after a week, two weeks, either get bored or exhausted. And one of my uh, compatriots, 
He said, listen, I heard you from Germany. Oh, yeah. Uh, you went voluntarily from Germany to Israel? Yeah, you must be crazy. And I heard that you converted to Judaism. Yes. You are uber crazy. And then I see that you're putting your life on the line to fight with us and go into the uh, army. You're one of us. You're crazy. So uh, I had not a yoda of, of anybody. I was concerned about it, but most of my the people that I know, they say, look, it's, it's an honor to be with you. Um, I've got a question from Philip Morris. Um, thank you for sharing such a moving and unprecedented story. I wonder about how your devout Catholic mother rationalized about what happened to the Jews and others in the concentration camps during the war. Hmm. Well, my mother, she knew what happened, but she had the following sentence always ready. Not everybody, we all suffered. We all, means Jews and Germans, we all suffered. So let's get over it and forget. So appreciating that people suffer, but let's go over it. Because we all suffered. The equivalent of Kumbaya, we all were suffering. And I said, look, mother, your suffering was horrible. But the suffering of the Jewish people, there's no word for it. it had to be invented. The Holocaust. So don't compare them. And she was very hurt when I said that. Okay. And I've got one here from Gwendolyn Lamb. What do you say about Holocaust deniers? What I say about Holocaust deniers, you cannot convince them. The more you talk to them, to, to talk to them in order to talk them out, the more recalcitrant they're getting. It's impossible to convince a Holocaust denier. It's not frustration, it's experience. Isolate them. Don't make them speak in events. Isolate them because but the worst thing that can happen to them that they cannot spread their vial uh, and their venom all over the place. Uh, just isolate them. Don't let them speak. Don't publish books of them unless you have to because First Amendment rights, but don't talk to them. It's useless, total useless. I know, it's, it's, just, it's just, it's pure hatred, isn't it? It's no, pure. There's no reason. There's no reason. Uh, it is pure hatred. It's pure, con they're convinced that you're evil. And you're convinced that the Jews are second-class citizens. Then you're convinced about all kinds of, I asked them specifically in the time of internet, said, do you really believe this QAnon theory that in the United States, a, our president has to fight against a cabal of uh, of child uh, molesting satanic uh, the underworld that eats children and drains their blood. I mean, you know the story about the the, uh, the Jews make matzahs out of blood for Christian children. The same nonsense is being spread and believed by people. Actually, there's one representative of the House of Congress, one of the Nutniks. She's now was elected on the on the Republican side. Uh, to who is a total supporter of this QAnon crazy satanic pedophile roaming gangs that Trump is fighting as a knight in shining armor. Bizarre. You cannot talk to them. They're just way off. In my book, they're paranoid delusional. They need a, a big one, a big haldo. Yeah, yeah. And a straight jacket. Could I, could I just change the subject slightly? Um, mm -hmm. And I just wondered how life for you, for uh, for your friends, relatives in your area or in Florida, how life has been affected by nearly quarter of a million people having died um, as a result of COVID-19. I lost patience and I'm every day fearful that I'm the next one infected because this is an airborne virus. I'm literally working under warlike conditions. Uh, number one, number two, I'm afraid of my family. Uh, number three, I'm afraid that, that they cannot practice the doctor anymore because they don't have supplies. Just yesterday, I was notified that certain vials that I'm using for blood testing that have a, a solution that neutral that uh, allows the blood specimen to be transported and then tested, that that is not available anymore because the supply chains to China are interrupted. It happened, we're getting down the tubes. And um, I'm not optimistic at all what's happening in the United States. And I'm not willing to go through the same story again and um, I'm I would be out of there I mean very simple I'm an Israeli um, I mostly deal with Israelis I socialize with Israelis but when it gets too hot we go okay I think I've got one last question and I think we can um, we can wrap it it's quite a long question um, it's from AC but we're not sure who AC is I'm sure they know um, the question is Vol Voltaire said that those who can make you believe absurdities can make you admit atrocities. What convinced you that your father, his peers, 
um, were actively deciding to hate. And to what extent does this ring alarm bells in today's geopolitical landscape? What did my father make? What, yeah, your, your father and his peers. Well, it's very simple. It's the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's very simple. They consider Jews as non-being. Non um, there's a systematic, call it the triad of anti-Semitism. First, you de-individualize Jews, call them Abraham and Sarah. That's what the Nazis did. Then you depersonalize them. They're not human. They are not, they're not people, they're just vermins. And number three, you don't demonize them and said they are responsible for all the bad things that happens to you. Therefore, we need to kill them. It's a logical consequence. Deindividualization, depersonalization, and then demonization. And that's happened all the time. And it happens right now in the world too. The good thing about us Jews, and I say us Jews, specifically when you went to the army, um, nobody will bleep with me. And my son, the same thing. M many of my friends, Israelis, we are armed. We know how to use the weapons, handguns. We go in the shooting range and, and to practice. Uh, we are proud to be Jews. And um, it, the difference is Jews have a state, we have an army, and we have people who are trained. So I once told the neo-Nazis who approached me, said, I give you five seconds to get the heck out of here, otherwise I shoot you. And he thought, do you really would do it? I said, absolutely. Okay. So when I, it's really, really bad. It's, it, there's no other word to it. And I never in my lifetime would have imagined that I would go through that such a time again. And in my lifetime believed that there are ideo ideologues that are whipping people into a frenzy. And I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I don't know what happened next week. If you ask me the, if I know the, what will happen, I cannot give you an answer. I know what will happen with me. I protect my family and protect my friends and my, my children. Okay. Um, anybody? Is anybody waving? One last question. If you want to ask questions, you oh. can send me an email too, and I can answer oh. those questions. Oh, okay. I've got your data. All, All right. right. Can you demute uh, Catherine and Marty? Hold on. Phil? Catherine and Marty? Well, it's a privilege. Always a privilege to speak in the, to the British crowd. And I Phil? Will, will tell you a little f secret. Uh, in 1977, 1976, my father sent me to Br Britain, the Great Britain at, at that time, to, um, to learn English and to get my head together. So I spent three, five months in Bournemouth and Pool. And, and I must say, you're, you have a beautiful country and I enjoyed my time. <laughs> yeah, speak, um, shout. Uh, Catherine, you have no more word. Um, I was just wondering whether you are aware of whether your father had been instrumental in directly in giving orders, perhaps, or even personally shooting yeah. any Jews. You said that, did I understand it correctly, that he was part of the invasion into Poland? Mm -hmm. uh, my entire paternal family was murdered Sorry to hear by that. incoming Nazis. Um, when you became aware of, of perhaps, I mean, what do, are you aware that he was personally instrumental? Or there are two points, pieces of evidence. Piece of evidence number one: he signed a letter um, transporting about six hundred Russian prisoners of war to a place called Birkenau. Yeah. So he for treatment. He knew mm -hmm. what happened there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Russians of prisoners of war. Let's not forget the gas too. Secondly, I found a. Uh, was given by a military historian, something he found in the archives of the former East German Stasi. Um, I don't know why they got there. Uh, it was a metal attaché suitcase, um, metal attaché case um, with, when I opened it up, there were torn pieces of Torah scrolls. And I asked the historian what that means. He said, well, in your father's unit, ripped into Jewish villages, they killed everybody, dragged out the Torah scrolls out of the, out of the Knesset, bitter Knesset, uh, cut, soaked them in water, sliced them into pieces, and used it as insulation material for the Russian, for the German tanks in the cold Russian winter. So my father knew and participated. There's no doubt in my mind. How long did it take you to come to terms with that knowledge? I never got in terms with that knowledge. Never did. It's, it's always the pain is always there. I'm a German. I'm my father's son, but according to the to the Talmud, mm -hmm. the children are not responsible for the sins of the father but they can choose it's not as easy as that though is it that's correct but they can choose to live a different life and uh hashem has 
actually when people say there is no God, specifically when you're in Auschwitz and see that Auschwitz is kind of the, like Rabbi Lau said, the former chief rabbi of Israel, is the abyss, is Dante's infirm on, on earth. And people ask, Jews asked, how can it be that there is a God when God allowed others to kill us? Because God, like Rabbi Lau said, is there. Hashem was there. And he cried about what his children did, making the wrong choices. And that's what it is. This is the, the essence of my belief. I don't believe in God, just believe it's a God. I believe because we can make choices that are given by us. We have made choices. We need to know these choices. We need to learn about the choices. Therefore, And then we can make the right one. But nobody will... Auschwitz will be, it's not the fault of a religion. It is the fault that people didn't make the decisions as individuals to stand up and say, no, we don't do that. And as such, I have a certain kind of guilt, certain big part of pride, and um, I never regretted what I did. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm exhausted, actually. Uh, you are an amazing person. Um, I think we'll be talking about this subject for quite a long time. Um, your stories are of real inspiration for us. Uh, Thank you. In the entire world. Um, they're stories of tolerance and hope and acceptance. Um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Bernd. And, um, thank you, David, as you allow me to hope to meet again. Uh, we will. Maybe in Miami. I will write down what, what you said and show it my wife that I'm an exceptional person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, good night, everybody. We would like to be with you in Florida. Unfortunately, there are no planes, so uh, oh, that's, uh, that's a small problem. We, it we will have to learn to swim. It will get better <laughs> with planes. <laughs> okay. okay. So, good, good night, everybody. Le, le droit, shalom, have shalom. a safe journey home. <laughs> thank, thank you. Very good. Very good talk. Thank you. Thank good you. night. Good night. Phil, have you got control? I, I have.